All right. All right, people of God, let's all stand up. And uh, let's uh, go to the Word of God, going to the book of Psalms, chapter 40, reading three verses. This is from the pen of King David, verse 1 says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my steps. He has put a new song in my mouth. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Let's bow. Father, I thank you today that you are but a cry away in any situation, no matter how dire or how hopeless looking. When we cry out to you, you hear us. And you quickly come to deliver us from our afflictions. Thank you, God, for that, for that understanding and knowledge. And we pray that you would drive this deep into our lives today, to our spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. All right. You may be seated. My message today is out of the horrible pit out of the horrible pit. I have a question for everyone this morning. Have you ever been in the pit? Or some would say, well, I don't know about that, but I've been in the pits. You ever talk to someone and they say, you ask them how they're doing and they say, I've been in the pits. Well, I didn't understand that years ago, but I understand it better now what they mean by that and the truth is everyone in this building at one time or another has been in the pits in fact some of you have been in the pit this week if we'll be honest we've all been there and it's a serious matter it's it's no laughing matter when you're in the pit because it can be so discouraging. You feel trapped. And in the trapping, you, you feel that your feelings and your whole roundabout is just gone into despair, even to desperation, which often leads to depression. And then sometimes even to the point of where you're hopeless and you're thinking there's no hope there's no way out of this pit it's so dark here it's so forlorn I feel so abandoned and lonesome in this place that I'm in right now and I've got to believe everyone in this house has been through that before I have I know that there's a lot of folks here who know about pits. There's people sitting here that I know that have been through severe financial issues, even to the point where you had to file bankruptcy. And during that time, it was difficult. It was hard. And you wondered, looking up out of that pit, am I ever going to be able to climb out of here? Or is it only going to get worse? There are people right here that have been in the pit of loss of health when it just seemed you were so sick that you were just so, had such feelings of destruction physically in your body that you just didn't know how you were going to get out of it. Some of you have fought through cancer. Some of you have thought, fought through 
uh, organ failure, and so on. Some of you have went through a lot of various issues. And you know what those things are. You know how it felt like that it was, in fact, no laughing matter. Some of you have gone through substance addictions. Some of you were alcoholics. Some of you were drug abusers. You know, and the Apostle uh, Paul, when he's speaking to various churches throughout uh, Asia and Greece and so on, he's, he names a list of various sins and destructive behavior. And he'll say things like, and such were some of you. The idea there is, but you came out of them. God delivered you out of those things. You're no longer the way that you used to be. But we've all been through some of these issues. Some of you have been locked up in prison. I've been in quite a number of prisons before, but going in with the knowledge I would be leaving within a couple of hours. But oftentimes as I'd walk through those barred gates, and sometimes it's one after the other, maybe three or four before you get to your destination, and you would hear the clanging of that gate behind you. There's something eerie about that. There's something disturbing about just to hear that sound. And I've often thought, what if they were bringing me in here? And I knew I wasn't coming out for a long time. I've never experienced that. But I know some of you have. You understand what it's like to have your freedom taken away, to be sitting in that cell, and you're feeling so lonesome, you're feeling so hopeless, and you're saying, God, where are you? You're feeling what it feels like to be in a pit. Some of you have gone through the agony, the destructiveness of going through a marriage failure. And seeing that marriage that started with such high hopes given over to destruction and to division of that marriage. You've seen family issues arise and maybe children and, and just seeing family breakups and divisions within between parents and children and so on. Some of you have just felt lonesomeness to such a point that it was palatable. You could feel it. It was, it was such an issue around you that you just knew that this is something like I've never felt before. I never want to go through this again. I feel abandoned. I feel betrayed. Some of you know what it means when I say you've been in the pit of someone betraying you. Someone you trusted, and they let you down royally. There are many ways that we can find ourselves in a pit, many things that we've gone through. Yesterday morning, I got a welcome call from uh, Johnson City, Tennessee, where my aunt, I, we call her Aunt Babe. That's her nickname. She was kind of the little one of the large family, and they called her Babe, and always been known as that, so... Aunt Babe, she's 88 years old, and she called me, and she wanted to chat for a while and talk. And I was just asking her, how are you doing in all of this that's going on, Babe? She said, Doyle, it's been a terrible time for me. Uh, she said, it feels like we started this year in January, and that I've never gotten out of January, that spring never came, summer never came. She said, I feel like I've been through eight months of January, one after the other. She said, how about you? Do you feel that way? And I said, honestly, Aunt Babe, I don't. I said, I haven't missed a beat. I said, I have not let any of this bear down on me at all. I said, I've had a most enjoyable year. And I said, it's been the best summer that I've had. In many years, it's just been... I wasn't trying to rub that in or, or in any way make her feel any worse, 
But I wanted Aunt Babe to know, listen, it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to live in everlasting winter. Spring is supposed to come. Summer thereafter. And I just wanted to let her know, it doesn't have to be that way. Amen. Amen. And I think she's an awesome Christian. She loves the Lord. I mean, while she's awake, Jerry, it's like every hour is being filled with ministry. And there are certain uh, cable, Christian cable television shows that she just watches relentlessly, you know, each and every day. And so I want to just start absorbing that more and be listening to those who can uplift her. Get her out of the pit and know that, yes, Jesus is coming, but that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And God will watch over us in the meantime. So I mentioned all of this and some of the things that some of you have gone through, but I want you to know Though most of the things that I mentioned a few moments ago, such as substance abuse and being in jail, financial bankruptcy, and serious health issues, I've been in many, many car accidents and motorcycle accidents and boat accidents and different things, but I've only spent one day, in, one night in the hospital since I was birthed back in 1955, uh, and that was, in, and even that case, and Juan, Judy, uh, you guys remember when this happened back in, I think it was 97 or 98, when uh, I went to Muskegon Hospital and was put in there, I'd been having severe chest pains. The Sunday before that, Ron, if you remember, I asked a group that I was teaching back then, the Kingdom Finders, I said, this is what I'm facing. It doesn't look good. The doctor has not given me uh, a good report here, but would you pray for me? And I remember while I was undergoing that procedure on my heart, and I was conscious of what was going on, I could hear what the doctor, the surgeon, was saying. And uh, as they went in expecting to find severe heart blockage, in my life because I'd been suffering some severe chest pain for several weeks. They had done tests, stress tests, and so on on me. Other tests and said, yes, it very much looks like you have heart blockage, Doyle. It may lead to open heart surgery, and if so, we'll probably just do that immediately. But I'll never forget, as I lay on that table, that surgeon's table, back over 20 years ago, I remember hearing that doctor say as he was probing into my heart, he said, wow, look at this. He said, there, there is no blockage in here whatsoever. He said, this guy's heart is as clean as a baby. And I remember laying there, my eyes were closed, but I could hear, but I just began to rejoice and praise God. I came up out of there, and they were so shocked, I think maybe upset almost. They hadn't found anything, and they came to me and said, we didn't find anything, but we know there's something wrong. We're going to keep you overnight, and we're going to put you through some more tests. The next day, they were doing all these tests on me, on my chest and everything. From the moment that I came up out of that, out of that surgeon's table, I want you to know that praise God, I never had any more chest pains after that. <laughs> Went into it with chest pains, came out of it completely healed and free. So, you know, I've not been in the pit very much. God has just protected me and, and covered for me in so many different ways. But I do know what it's like to be in a pit. I'm not going to give you the details of that pit, but I want you to know I was in it. And it's still today, this was years ago, but it's hard for me to explain, Cynthia, how I felt that day. And I started thinking about it this weekend. How did you feel during that time? And I could only come up with a little bit. I felt completely helpless, like, my God, 
I don't know how I'm going to get out of this pit. And secondly, I felt what I can only describe as sheer panic. I felt just unbelievable, unbelievable waves of panic coming over me like waves as I was in that pit. And then I prayed. Oh, I prayed and immediately God provided. I'll never forget those two people that made themselves available to me. And they knew that my heart was very much in great disturbance. They knew that I was struggling so mightily. Now I remember those people, even though they may have had to work the next day. We started that evening, Donna, and we prayed until the next morning. And they prayed with me, knowing they were still going to have to go to work. But by the time the sun rose, I was free. I was delivered. I was out of the pit. What can we say from that? One thing is, if you're in a pit right now, you don't have to spend the next 10 months in that pit. God can bring you out in an instant. He can do it, and he wants to do it. Praise God. Yes, he wants to do it. And there is a purpose in that pit. There was a purpose in me being in that pit, both the time physically and the other time emotionally, God had a purpose and wasn't going to waste that time. In this passage in Psalms 40, this is King David who is speaking. It's not like the pit that Jeremiah was in. You can read about it in Jeremiah 38. Jeremiah was in a literal pit. He came out. It was a time of great turmoil for Israel, and he came out to Israel. He came out to the king and the nobles and so on, and he warned them. He said, don't fight the king of Babylon. Just submit to him. If you do, you'll save the city, and you'll save your own lives. But there's going to be no hope in this city if you do anything else. Well, because of that, the nobles of the city... King came to the king, Zechariah, I believe, and they said, Oh, king, you need to take this man, Jeremiah. He is not helping matters here. He is disturbing the courage of our soldiers, telling us to give up. He said, Take him and kill him, king, because he's disturbing what we're trying to do. And King Zechariah said, do with him what you want. And they took Jeremiah and they bound him and they took him to this deep cistern, a large enclosure, a bowl that you could not get out of that trapped the rains so that they would have rain during the dry times. But this cistern was dry except it only had a very deep coating of mud. And they lowered him down into that mud. No food, no water, no bed, no sustenance. He was indeed in a pit of literal making. He cried out to God. Sister Esmeralda, he knew how to cry out to God. And there was a man that lived there in that city, an Ethiopian of all people. And he came to the king and he said, what you have done to this prophet is wrong, and God is not pleased. And he said, I say to you, O king, let us go and rescue Jeremiah out of this pit. He said, do what you must. And he took 30 men with him, and they lowered the ropes, which were covered with rags so it would not hurt his body, as they sucked him out of that pit. Can you imagine not just standing in the mud up to your waist? And the decrepitness, the stink, the awfulness of that, of that, awfulness of it. Nowhere to lay down, just in the pit of mud. Some of you probably have felt that in your own pit where there was no place to lie down for comfort. But God heard his prayers. And they lowered the ropes down, the ropes down, and they lifted him up. 
And they brought him to the king. And the king said, say what you say, Jeremiah. What is God saying? He said, I'll tell you, but you need to listen to this and not kill me when I tell you. And he spoke the truth to the king. David wasn't in that kind of pit, but I would say, I would venture that during this time that David was in this very deep emotional pit. And like Jeremiah, he too said, I waited upon the Lord, and the Lord heard me. He heard me. Sometimes we're in that pit, Brother Raul. What we need to do is just pray a one-word prayer that can be so effective. And I've prayed this prayer many times, and it's just help. Help, Lord. Help. Sometimes something's coming at you so quick, all you have time to do, and I've been in those times and car accidents, and so on. Or the car is spinning out of control at 60 miles an hour. I've hit those black ices. I know what it's like to spin at 60 miles an hour, not knowing where I'm going to end up. And it's an effective prayer when we say, Help! Just last week, I hesitate to tell this story because Nancy's mother is in here. We were up north riding on our motorcycle. We were in a line of traffic. I don't remember how fast we were going, at least 60, maybe 70, on a four-lane road. And all of a sudden, I seen the cars ahead of me, and they hit their brakes quickly. And I hit my brake. Guess what? No brakes. So what do you do? You're coming right at the rear bumper of this car. You've got the brakes pressed down. No brakes. I don't remember what Nancy said. It was not an expletive. But if she said anything, I know she said, Jesus, hell! Because I've heard her say that a lot of times with me at the wheel. Jesus, help! The Lord enabled me to go off the road into the gravel. I didn't sense this, but Nancy did and spoke of it. She said, Doyle, I felt our rear end going off the road, off of the gravel. And I prayed, and God moved us back on. And I believe that. <laughs> God is so good. He is so good. Help, Lord. Then, after David cried, verse 40, or chapter 40, verse 2, he said, He brought me, he also brought me up out of a horrible pit. Not just a pit, man, I'm talking a horrible one. Out of the miry clay. And he set my feet upon a rock. And he established my steps. You know, I've lived, some would call it a charmed life. Some would say, you've been awfully lucky, Doyle, but I don't believe in living a charmed life. I don't believe in luck, good or bad. I don't give any credit to my blessing to luck or any such thing. I give it to God. But I admit I've lived a very blessed life in so many ways. And I'm a reader, and I've read the biographies of hundreds, if not thousands of people. And I read about all of the awful things that they've gone through. A number of years ago, one of my clients, knowing how much I love to read, he used to bring me a lot of books. And he brought me a book one day, and it was by a man by the name of Dave Peltzer. Dave Peltzer has written several books. His first one that he gave me was a book called A Child Called It. And his mother, not only was she an incorrigible alcoholic and substitute, substance abuser, 
But after reading the things that she put this child through, I have to believe she was absolutely demonically possessed. For 12 years, he endured the most horrible physical and emotional abuse that a person could be put through. In fact, the state of California for years said that his case was the second worst child abuse case in the history of the state of California. It's an amazing book what he went through, but even more amazing that he came out of it successfully and that he travels the world today telling people about his experience, but how he came out of it and how there is hope for them. And if Dave Peltzer can come out of that, friend, you can come out of your pit. Someone asked him, he said, often people ask me and say, David, if you could go back and change the circumstances of your situation in your first 12 years, would you go back and change anything? And he thinks about it and he says, no, I wouldn't change one thing. And they said, why not? There's two reasons. First of all, he says, my life is so good. My life is so blessed that I appreciate everything in my life today because I know what it was like my first 12 years. The second reason that he's thankful he wouldn't change it, and this is the way you should feel about the pit you were in. That pit has purpose. God allowed you. He didn't create the pit. I've been reading the book of Job. God didn't put Job in the pit that he was in. God didn't take his family. God didn't rob him of his wealth and of his health. The enemy did it, but God allowed it. Why? So that he could come forth a shining light and begin to give glory to God who brought him up out of his pit. There's a purpose in your pit. It's why you've gone through it. Why? So that God could use it for his glory and so that you could be a light and a help and a blessing to someone else who's going through the very thing that you went through. God wants you to reach down and help people out of their pits. You that have been through it are more ably qualified to reach down and say, grab my hand. Just grab my hand. Come. A little closer. Stretch. And bring them out of that cistern of miry clay. God uses people who are experienced. David also spoke about a pit. I don't know if the same one or another one over in um, Psalm 69, verses 1 through 3. Let me read this quickly. This is David. He's crying out to God again. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I've come into deep waters where the floods overthrow me. I'm weary. I'm weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. I'm waiting, Lord. Help me. Help me. And God did. God brought him forward. He said, I'm up to my neck, of essentially, in alligators. I read the story a couple of years ago about the little girl. I don't think she was more than eight or nine years old. And somehow she got lost out in the Florida Everglades and was out there for a few days alone. I don't know what you, if you can imagine spending the night where alligators are around you, where snakes, some of them big enough to swallow you, or poison you but she came forth I don't know if this is true but I believe that God sent an angel to that little girl and he protected her from all that wildlife around her that could have easily destroyed her and swallowed her and never seen her again 
I believe there was somebody that were praying for that little girl, and God sent his help in the midst of it all. Somebody may be sitting here right now. You've just been through so much. You've endured so much, and some of you are probably thinking, even as I preach this, Pastor, I'm in a pit. I've been in it a long time. I just cannot see the way out of it. I would say to you that perhaps you've not reached the point of being motivated enough. I've told you before that my tolerance for pain is very low. I'm talking about emotional pain. I think I can take physical pain about as good as anyone else, on average at least. But my pain tolerance for emotional pain is very limited. And therefore, when I find myself getting into a situation that's going to involve emotional pain, Brother James, I just quickly say, help me, God. Pull me back. I don't want to get any closer to that because I don't want to endure the pain that that brings me to. Maybe we're just not motivated enough. I, I read the story of a man... I'm not sure if it's true or not, but it sounds like it could be. It was one very rainy night, kind of like it was Friday. We were traveling home on Friday night when that storm hit. And it was a fierce storm that Nancy and I found ourselves in. The rain was coming in sheets to the point we literally couldn't see the road. Another time where God just kind of got us through it. Couldn't see the road or anything else. But we got through it. And there was... A man going home from a bar that night, and it started raining like that. And it was dark and lightning and thundering and, and the sheets of rain coming down. He thought, I'm going to take a shortcut home. I know if I cut through the cemetery, I can get home in half the time. And so he started walking through that cemetery, pitch dark, and they had just that morning had dug a fresh grave and he fell into that deep grave and it was mud and mire and slush and filling with water and he tried with all of his might to get out of there you can just imagine Lisa you're in a grave it's dark you're in this terrible uncomfortable position but he could not get out as hard as he tried and so finally, he figured, just save your strength. Just kind of huddle up there on one end of the grave. They'll come in the morning. They'll help you out. So he sat there. Well, about an hour later, another man coming from that bar had the same idea. He was truncing along through there and fell into the same grave. And the man at the other end that's honest, on his behind and got his knees covered. He's just not saying anything. He's just watching this man. And this man is jumping and doing everything he can do to get out of there. It's dark. You can't see anything. And finally, the man sitting at the other end said, I'm going to put him out of his misery. He said, he says, quit trying. You ain't ever going to get out of here. How many of you know he did get out of there? He shot, he shot out of there. Sometimes we just need a little more motivation. But I really want to speak here at the very end to that person that says, I've been in a pit for so long. I think it's my destiny to be in this pit. God must want me to be in this pit. I'm here to declare to you I'm confident in this. I can assert this with a guarantee. God does not want your address to be 666 Pitt Street. That's the satanic residence that Satan wants you to be at. God doesn't want you to have that as your permanent address. Do you believe that? 
I was reading the story this weekend about how Alcoholics Anonymous started AA. The man that started AA, and I've read about this over the years, different things, was a man that they just identify as Bill W. Bill W. I looked at the background of how this came about, James. It was just desperate for relief, and he started going to a psychiatrist. One of the best-known psychiatrists that the world's ever known, a man by the name of Carl Jung. And Carl Jung, who was really good at his craft, week after week, month after month, he did everything within his power. He pulled out every trick in his bag, and yet this man would come back every week defeated, succumbed to alcohol. And finally, Carl Jung says, I give up. I've tried everything. I believe you're just destined to be a drunk. And the man was, was desperate. He said, oh, please, don't say that. Is there anything else you can do? And Carl thought about it. He said, there's only one thing I can think of. He said that you need a spiritual solution. You, and I, you need to find a spiritual answer to this. So the guy went and he looked all over for a spiritual answer. And he searched for years. And finally, after about four years, he found God in his life. Walking along one day and ran into another friend. He said, hey, Joe, he says, let's go get a drink together. We've been drinking buddies. And he said, I'm sorry, I don't drink anymore. He said, you know what? He said, no. He said, what happened? He said, I found a spiritual answer. God freed me from this. And the guy says, really? Well, if you could do it, I can too. And he went out and started looking for a spiritual answer. For two years, he sought for that answer. And finally, after two years, he found God. And God delivered him. I know this is going on a while, but finally, he ran into another man. His name was Bill. Bill W. And he said, hey, buddy, let's go get a drink together and, and just knock some back for old times. He says, I don't do that any longer. spiritual answer, I found God. And Bill said, well, if you can do it, I can too. Two weeks later, he found God, and God took the desire for alcohol away from him, and he started gathering like men who were having the same problems. And from that, AA came about in just a few weeks' time. There have been millions of men and women around the world that have benefited from that. They talk about a higher power, but we know that it's Jesus Christ that delivers men and women who are in chains and bondage and brings them home. Praise God. Finally, the verse 3 of Psalms 40. Praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and will trust in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. There's a new song in my mouth. I don't sing the same old song. He's put a new song in my mouth. In Hebrews, I was just quoting this scripture a week or so ago to a man who needed to hear it. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. Let's read that. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set And has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. Lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Why did Jesus allow himself to be put through that awfulest of all deaths. And terrible persecution and torture. Because. He knew the joy that awaited him for having been obedient to the Father. That enabled him to get through the awfulest of awful situations. And if God enabled him to get through that, you and I can get through our situations as well. Your pit has a purpose and God's David said, and trust, and put their trust in the Lord. Here's the deal. Gabe, what you've gone through, and we look at you, when I look at you, I don't see Gabe. I see a miracle. A miracle. You're a miracle. We're all sitting here as miracles. And you're going to get through whatever. God will not allow you to go through anything rose that he will not at the same time give you a way of escape, if necessary. God is never going to abandon you or saying, or you'll never be able to honestly say, God, you put me through something worse than I was able to take. Not so. I think back to that wonderful poster that I used to look at. It said, Lord, I saw, looking back, and I saw just one foot, or one print, one set of footprints. Lord, why in that time when I needed you most, did you forsake me and abandon me? He said, child, I didn't abandon you. I picked you up. I was carrying you through that thing. Oh, God. Nancy asked me recently, I'd been going through kind of a day full of, of uh, ministering to people, several people, several hours that day ministering to various people. Nancy asked me at the end of the day, she said, Doyle, she said, I've watched you today. She said, do you just feel drained after all that? Do you just feel like you're just wore out? I thought... I said, the more I minister, the stronger I feel. The more blessed I become. And I said, no, I'm never drained from ministering to somebody. It's, it's a joy. It's a joy. And if we weren't following in his footsteps, we would miss out on that joy. Amen? Many will see it. Gabe, they're going to trust in the Lord. Because I'll say, I knew Gabe when he was 